The first question is, how do you replenish your cognitive reserve after injury? What should you do? Can you give us some examples? Well, in my view, um, social interaction is important. Uh, gradual reintroduction of uh, things that you formerly did. Trying to determine where your threshold is for symptoms. So for example, let's take exercise. Uh, exercise is a wonderful way to try to restore brain function. But exercise we know in excess brings on symptoms. So we try to teach people to recognize when exercise does produce a symptom and that is your personal threshold for that particular exercise. In general, exercises that don't jiggle the brain are preferred. So for example, a uh, stationary bicycle does not jiggle the brain, whereas jogging does jiggle the brain. So for example, every time you jog, the brain is, is moving. So jogging is not a good exercise to do during recovery from concussion, but swimming is a good exercise, especially uh, the backstroke or side stroke. There is no movement of the brain during those. With the crawl, yes, there is movement of the brain. So that's going to be less well tolerated. But everybody is different, and you have to establish what your threshold is for each individual exercise. But it's important to try. Exercise does a whole range of important things, even producing growth factors. It's quite amazing that modern research has proven that growth factors are produced by the brain itself. So the brain actually produces nourishing chemicals that help the brain. It's part of the concept of neuroplasticity that um, Dr. Rattan uh, mentioned. So let's go on from exercise to cognitive activity. So some form of cognitive activity also exercises uh, the brain, not just physical exercise, but actual cognitive activity. So reading, uh, writing, uh, watching TV, uh, reading a book, reading, the, reading a newspaper, all of those cognitive activities help with neuroplasticity of trying to improve brain uh, reserve. Again, you have to establish where your threshold is for each of those activities. And it's so variable from one person to another. Some people have no computer intolerance. We, we call it computer intolerance or screen intolerance, means that when you're sitting in front of a computer, your symptoms are intensified. That is usually the case, but some people have none of that. If you do have computer intolerance, and for example, if a computer is a major issue in your life, it may be your uh, recreational, activity or maybe you have to do it for work. So it's good to tr try to do it, to try to gradually introduce it. The emphasis has to be on gradual, going up to where your threshold is. It, it, it is generally felt that uh, concussion is different from any other body part that's injured, where often physiotherapists, for example, will say, no pain, no gain. That ain't the case for concussion, because if you produce pain, if you accentuate symptoms by an activity, whether it's physical activity or cognitive activity, your concussion symptoms are gonna last longer.
So don't go beyond your uh, threshold. Okay, great. Okay, so some really great questions. Um, after one and a half years, can mild issues with higher level thinking still resolve? What can I do to improve this? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can mild? So mild issues with higher level thinking. So I'm guessing reasoning, problem solving. I'm, I'm guessing that might be the types of things the individual meant. Well, I think that it's, this, it's a similar principle to what we were saying. So that even at one and a half years, trying to push the envelope is what we recommend, but not to the point of making yourself ill. S try to gradually increase. So the emphasis has to be on gradual. Or if you reach a complete block, for example, you can't increase your screen time uh, by, by any amount, like even 10 seconds of screen time is still aggravating, then it's pointless to persist with screen, but perhaps changing to written, uh, to, to print media, for example, uh, trying to use an e-reader. E-readers are uh, uh, tolerated by most people, uh, like Kindle or Kobo, whereas regular computers can be very, sim can produce significant symptoms. So next question, what is head pressure after concussion caused by? I, the person says, I'm not describing a headache. It feels like the head is full of air, especially act after activity or being around noise. Uh, good question, but we don't have a clue. In other words, the feeling of, we don't even know where the feeling of pressure arises within the brain. Pressure is often a symptom. Uh, patients have difficulty uh, describing, in fact, what they are experiencing with uh, feelings of pressure. It's a very common symptom. It's different from headache, uh, but again, we're not even sure exactly what happens with headache. Uh, there is some evidence that perhaps um, it indicates greater blood flow, uh, that that's actually what's being um, experienced. Uh, the blood flow to the brain is enormous, more than any other organ. And we um, recognize that this may be an important feature. It's a, it's a hot topic in concussion research to try to be able to measure blood flow. And perhaps there is greater blood flow uh, after concussion. We don't know that for sure. Okay. Uh, next question. Why do things like watching a train go by or fast moving things or objects affect people with concussions? That, that's a great question um, because it's a very frequent symptom that anything that's in motion is especially difficult for people who are recovering from concussion, and we're not sure. We do think it's the number of circuits that are activated. They, it, it, a, huge, a huge part of the brain, both the cortex and the white matter, is taken up with vision. Uh, in in uh, dogs, for example, a huge portion of the brain is taken up with processing the sense of smell. Well, in us, the sense of smell part of the brain is really contracted, but the visual processing part of the brain is gigantic. And moving objects, for example, when you, uh, let's say you're, you're sitting in a train watching the countryside go by, uh, that is a, a gigantic load on the brain. The, the number of neurons that are firing, the number of messages that are going back and forth in the white matter of the brain is, is in the millions just by looking at a scene. 
And, and in fact, that is why TV, it's the same phenomenon with TV, uh, with the TV, a regular TV screen or a regular uh, computer screen has a huge uh, refresh rate. The average computer refreshes at about 60 hertz. That means 60 times a second the image is actually changing. Now you don't see it changing, but your brain is doing all of that fusion of images so that it's doing that enormous work. But the normal functioning brain can handle that. But after a concussion, uh, it becomes a huge load for the brain to process. Okay. Why are we advised to avoid alcohol? Uh, that's really a good question. Uh, again, we're not sure why it is that alcohol should be avoided. My own view is rather simple, and that is that alcohol is a toxin. It's very toxic to the brain. If we have a, if we in the laboratory, if you uh, take a piece of brain tissue and immerse it in alcohol. Uh, the brain cells are completely destroyed. It's a fixative. It actually, it actually kills cells. Now, obviously, when you take a drink, it circulates through your body. Your brain doesn't get that full load that it would get if we just immersed the brain in alcohol. But uh, the, in, the sensitivity to alcohol goes up uh, gigantically in most people uh, after uh, a concussion. And in fact, uh, our usual advice is uh, one drink only and not every day. So don't drink every day. Never drink more than one drink. Uh, it will retard your recovery. If the brain itself has no pain sensors, what actually is hurting in a headache? No, no clues whatsoever. <laughs> we don't, we, we can't answer that question. In fact, um, we, we, we gave a, a concussion presentation this afternoon to another uh, audience <coughs> and on our panel this afternoon, uh, is a neuro was a neuroscientist who has spent her entire career studying pain, and she's unable to answer that question. It's a great question. <laughs> All right, um, vision therapy. What about vision therapy? And uh, you didn't mention vision problems with PCS. I, I think we might have a little bit, but do you have comments on vision therapy? Well, the, the, because vision is, is a hugely common uh, problem for people, uh, a lot of effort has gone into trying to figure out what it is about vision that is so difficult after a concussion. And uh, some of the obvious um, answers are, well, the eyes just don't line up. So it may be a mechanical problem rather than a processing of image problem. So if it's a mechanical problem, which appears to be reasonably common, then can we do anything to improve the alignment of the eyes? Well, into the void has marched an army of optometrists. Uh, and, on t and in Ontario, I suppose because we're pretty good in Ontario, are there any optometrists here? We're pretty good in Ontario because of the of, um, University of Guelph, where, is, where there's a major optometry school. And many of those folks think that they have something to offer to uh, concussed patients to improve the tracking ability of the eyes, the alignment of the eyes, um, and they've also tackled other problems like uh, color, you know, is there, is there a better color 
uh, for example, um, computer screens are often blue because blue is easier on the brain, for, as an example. S uh, blue glasses, for example, have helped some people. So the optometrists have discovered some tricks, but the rest of us are not sure about some of their other tricks, whether they're really onto something or not, because almost everybody who goes to an optometrist comes back with a sheet of diagnoses that's, uh, you know, a foot long, and we're just not sure about the scientific validity of it. It's also extremely costly. Uh, the exercises that they uh, recommend uh, the fact that they want you to be there to do the exercises. Most of them don't want you to do the exercise at home. They want you to go to their offices, do the exercises under supervision. Uh, and it can run into thousands of dollars. And we have many uh, examples where it's been useless. Uh, there are some people who say, you know, it really did help. I can track things better without getting a headache. Um, but the jury is out on most of it. Has anybody here tried I optometry? Did, I to, I'm, I'm looking. I tried to pump and it's a problem. I cannot look, I cannot see parallel, like my eyes, I can look is a one or another. And first concussion I had before, I didn't have any problem with eyes. I never even think that I will ever have a problem. So have you tried optometry? No, I cannot find. After first concussion, I wasn't even mentioned. But you mentioned concussion. stroke, though. No, okay. I have concussion? first, I guess, like from 18 floor, some kids throw some heavy object, and second concussion, bicycle is oh, okay. uh, direct. Hit well, you might, concrete. you know, you might be benefited if you jump in my eyes, my face, my pain everywhere. And it's probably worth going for an assessment to, to, one, of, to one of these optometrists. They, a, they advertise on the website, so if you... I'd like to know name. I yeah. don't know where to go. And my husband passed away last year, additional to all this concussion, so I'm yeah. completely lost. They're not hard to find if you... If you send us an email, we'll tell you okay. where they are. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, sure. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Keep Thank going. Yep. Okay. All right. So, apropos of your question, this is a very important question. So, to whom can we talk to about all of the concerns that we have? Um, who can guide us in terms of accessing the referrals that we need, we don't know what we need? Who can help us? Well, in terms, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we sort of comes under the category of who does what. And a lot of this is not really sorted out, not only in Toronto and Ontario and Canada, but really worldwide, because I'm sure you're aware that concussion up until the last uh, five years or so is, is it has been completely neglected by the healthcare professions. Uh, and that's why we're really playing catch up in terms of trying to provide services and also in trying to do the research to answer some of these important questions. Um, so the question of where to go, well I think the best place to start with is your family doctor. We want the family doctors to play a role in managing this. Uh, in the past, especially the older family doctors will probably not be up to speed on concussion, but the younger ones are because we have made sure that concussion is now on the curriculum of uh, all the medical schools in the country. So it's a different ball game than it was even five years ago. So the younger family doctors should be considered a resource. Uh, very often sports medicine physicians, uh, pediatricians for younger people, 
uh, emergency doctors, um, neurologists are clued in, neurosurgeons, uh, physical medicine uh, doctors are generally up to speed on concussions. So there are a lot of doctors who are now uh, playing an effective role uh, in helping people with concussions. In addition, there's a whole range of therapists who can be accessed as well. For example, occupational therapists for helping with some of the issues regarding return to work uh, have been very, very helpful. Physiotherapists can help if there's an associated whiplash. Uh, whiplash is a very common association. In fact, approximately 25% of people who have been concussed will also have whiplash. Uh, and if the neck symptoms are not dealt with, then that's going to be a continuing uh, irritation. Social workers are now playing a role. Uh, Vestibular therapists, that's another area of uh, frequent symptoms. Uh, the inner ear mechanism is an extremely delicate uh, mechanism. And the sensation of um, vertigo, some form of vertigo, some imbalance, uh, sometimes it, pl it is actual true vertigo where the room moves or your head is actually, you feel that your head is moving. Those are very common symptoms after concussion. And in some people, uh, those symptoms can be alleviated significantly by a vestibular therapist. So that's, it's, it's, it's a, um, a definite um, healthcare professional branch that has arisen to treat people with uh, significant vertigo and they, they can help uh, significantly. I hope that has provided some information about who does what. Okay, now this is a question that you have certainly uh, touched on and, and discussed, but I, I think I want to make sure that I read everybody's questions. So, uh, regarding TV screen tolerance, or TV and screen tolerance, um, will watching TV monitor screens worsen the condition? Uh, they tend to cause dizziness and vertigo. Yeah, the, that's a good question. And I think it's the same answer as we talked about for other activities. A graduated introduction of that activity to the point of, you, of your personal threshold. And there are things that you can do, even with a regular uh, computer screen or TV, you can alter the brightness in most uh, TVs. You can change the color. You can wear sunglasses. You can uh, wear different color sunglasses. So there are a whole bunch of strategies that you could try to improve your uh, tolerance. Um, you, it has it, 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 where computers are important for employment. Uh, occupational therapists are very helpful in trying to alter the um, computer to suit your health needs. And I, as I mentioned, um, the, some of the strategies are, for example, to not use a regular computer, but to use a Kobo or Kindle. Because the, the Kobo or Kindle, the e-reader, that's the classification of technology that they are part of. The e-reader... Mindfulness meditation, where do you find sessions? Leslie? Yeah. Why don't you yeah. handle so that? In the, there, there are lots of these courses uh, available. Uh, some are offered through hospitals. There are other ones offered through private practitioners. They tend to be you know, a little bit more expensive. Uh, but we have listed um, some resources, I believe, in the handout at the back. A good website that lists all different programs in, in the GTA is Mindfulness 
uh, Toronto. Uh, so if you go onto their website, they have a whole resource section that will uh, where you can find my courses. Great. Okay. How do you know when you're ready to return to work, school, on a gradual basis? Is it a bad idea if you're still experiencing headaches daily? Uh, terrific question. And the answer is different now than it would have been, let's say, two or three years ago. So we have changed our mind about return to work. So let's handle return to work first, and then we can say something about return to school. But in terms of work, we used to regard work as the enemy. No, 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 don't go back to work till you are completely ready, which some insurance companies and some employers are often demanding. For example, if you're a hydro line person and you have to climb poles to fix the wires, they don't want to see you back until you are 100%. But that, uh, that prohibition against return to work is confined to a very few jobs. But for most jobs, we now recommend graduated return to work. But the term graduated has to be carefully considered. Um, so if, for example, if you have terrific uh, screen intolerance and your job is eight hours a day in front of a computer terminal, how could you return to work? So if you do return to work, your work has to be different from what it was uh, before you got the concussion. Many employers are quite decent about altering the job to suit your symptoms. Uh, many employers are horrible and uh, don't uh, want to work with you. But we're finding that uh, more and more they understand the post-concussion syndrome they're, they're, and they're, they're getting a better appreciation that if they give a little, there would be very good gains because that person would get back to work earlier. So try on a graduated basis altering whatever you can. So for example, if, if, if you're in uh, a, a bright uh, environment with a lot of um, fluorescent lighting and it's noisy as well, and you have a combination of photophobia and sonophobia, which means sensitivity to sound, then you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to handle it. So if the employer is decent, they will put you in a less well-lit location with some noise abatement, or they'll give you uh, noise abatement earphones if they really want you back uh, to work. So if they work with you, you can return. And so rather than thinking of work as the enemy, we now think of work as part of the therapy. We like people to go back to work earlier um, in the dose that they can tolerate. And again, it's this issue of threshold. So how much can you tolerate? We usually say, if you can, if you can see yourself going for an hour a day at the beginning, it's probably worthwhile. You have to, you know, the stress of getting there, the stress of getting home. But if you can actually be there for an hour a day, that's worthwhile if the employer will work with you. Uh, if you can't, if you don't think you can handle an hour a day, it's probably not worthwhile. But then you, maybe you could do it at home. Maybe you could work an hour a day at home. And maybe not every day. Maybe it's going to be every other day or twice a week. So we like people to try to re, um, 
to, to reintroduce themselves to their usual activities. And, and the same goes with return to learn. So the return to learn advice is, is similar to that. But again, the, the schools have to be compliant with that. And, and most schools now are compliant. It started with elementary and high schools, but now the universities are generally compliant so that uh, students can return on a part-time basis uh, to, uh, to, to school based on a graduated return to learn um, program. So um, how often do we have to check the concussion through the MRI? That's a good question. Um, I think it was stated earlier that MRI doesn't detect any abnormalities in the concussed patient. We do MRI to ensure that there isn't any other uh, issue present, that there isn't a stroke, that there isn't a growth, there isn't any area of pre-existing uh, brain damage. So we like to see, it with, with post-concussion syndrome, we usually order an MRI if somebody is still symptomatic after about three months, sometimes earlier, sometimes a month, but usually not before then, and there's no reason to repeat the MRI. So one MRI is sufficient, doesn't have to be repeated. Uh, but in general, it's being used to rule out other problems that might also be present that have gone undetected. We are hoping eventually that the MRI will be providing diagnostic information or perhaps information about recovery. Um, but at the current uh, state of resolution of MRIs that are available clinically, we, we get no information about recovery process. Uh, or even severity of concussion. We're happy to see a normal MRI because then we're assured that there's nothing else to worry about. Okay. So if you have had multiple concussions, how long after the most recent uh, should you wait to start to watch TV, go for a long walk, exercise, read, go out socially, sort of resume daily activities? In, in general, after a concussion, severe restriction of activity shouldn't last more than a few hours or you know, one day at, at most. And then after that, gradual reintroduction. Even if it's, even it's the 10th concussion, it's the same uh, procedure to get over it, the same graduation of physical and cognitive activity. Okay. okay. Um, what are your thoughts on cranial sacral therapy? Uh, one word, useless. Um, if anybody here has benefited from it, I'll be happy to take your testimonial. But my view is that it is hocus pocus. Anybody know what Hocus Pocus is? <laughs> Mom, uh, it, there's just no scientific basis for its value unless it produces a state of mindfulness meditation. Does it, Leslie? I've never had it. It feels good. As, no, I think, I think it's one of those completely non-evidence-based therapies for concussion that's advertised on the internet by clever marketers. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, what is an example of a rotational concussion? What type of accident would create 
rotation, and within that, uh, is the recovery longer for a rotational concussion? Those are all good questions. Um, the best example of a rotational injury is what the boxers do. A very skilled boxer knows how to knock somebody out. And the way you knock somebody out is you, you uh, punch them in the chin, uh, especially if their head is down a little bit, or they just wait for the right moment, and then they deliver the knockout blow. And what they're doing is taking advantage of rotation. So if, when the head rotates, the brain is set in motion, especially if there's significant force. So that is the best example. Uh, Scott Stevens, with his shoulders, uh, who was a great hockey player, uh, he used to knock out people regularly just by hitting them in the shoulder. He was, he was a master of uh, knocking people out. Uh, and, uh, you know, lauded for this wonderful uh, activity. Um, so those are ex good examples of how rotational acceleration <laughs> happens because the brain actually jiggles inside the skull. The, um, some, some researchers feel that linear acceleration, which is the front to back motion, or some side to side motion, but not with rotation, that some, some researchers feel that you can't actually create a concussion with linear acceleration. I don't really believe that. Um, a lot of very good biomechanical research has been done in the past few years, in Canada especially. Uh, there, we, we have had a few very good biomechanical labs in the country that have contributed significantly to knowledge of how concussions occur biomechanically. And the emphasis is on this rotational acceleration, and that is exactly why helmets are useless for preventing concussion, because it doesn't matter how many helmets, you, you could put 10 helmets on the, on the head, but the brain would still move within those helmets. So we have to be smarter in terms of preventing concussion than merely wearing a helmet. But as uh, Leslie said so well, the concussions, the, the helmets do prevent all the other terrible brain injuries that you can get. But every hockey player, every football player that we see for post-concussion syndrome has been wearing the finest helmet, but even the finest helmet is useless for preventing concussion. Well, I would be dead without one. It's Pardon me? I would be dead without helmet, definitely. It's like everything back and I still alive. I was in helmet. Yeah, you, you survive the injury, but you still get yeah. a concussion. Yeah. Okay. Um, aerobic exercise programs. Uh, is there a guide or counselor? You know, where are programs that people with concussions could um, go to? Is there anyone that could oversee it? Can you recommend any particular programs or individuals? Um, if you need that type of rigor, I think every physiotherapist could provide you with some supervision of graduated exercise. But following a few simple principles that we have enunciated, I think you can really do it on your own. There have been some labs that have um, postulated that you should pay strict attention to your heart rate uh, and that uh, you know you should go up by one beat every two days and increase your heart rate and you'll get better faster if you pay attention to your heart rate. Um, I think that is nonsense. 
um, because there's no evidence that uh, heart rate is the key. Yes, heart rate does go up with gradually increasing intensity of activity, but monitoring heart rate, I think, is uh, a waste of time for people who are recovering from concussion. You, you just do the exercise, and if you want to count something, you can you know, count how long you can last before symptoms um, are, uh, occur, or how intense you can make the pedals of the bicycle make you work harder if you want to monitor something. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, normal MRI does not always detect concussion. It never detects concussion. Can functional MRI better detect concussion? That's a, that is a good question. Uh, that's a hot research topic. Uh, la we have an annual concussion symposium um, in our center, and uh, last year we had a guest speaker who made the statement that functional MRI allows detection of concussion, and he was seriously challenged. Uh, most of us don't believe it. Uh, certainly not in an individual case. If you take 100 MRIs uh, of, of 100 concussed patients and you compare them with 100 patients who haven't had concussion, you may detect group differences. But if you give an expert at one individual functional MRI, it's hopeless. They'll never detect who had the concussion. So the jury is out, but I think functional MRI is not going to be the winner of the race to find the imaging technique that will finally be able to diagnose concussion. We've all been looking for it, uh, and certainly the rewards, imagine the rewards for the researcher or the hospital that has that eureka moment, ah, I've discovered the way to diagnose concussion. Like, it would, it would be lovely. I hope it happens here. Uh, we, ha we have about five different competing strategies that we're exploring for uh, finding that the holy grail of concussion diagnosis, but at the present time, concussion is still a what we call a clinical diagnosis. It's made by a skilled clinician and a compliant patient. So if you go to a doctor who's completely um, uninformed of concussion, it, it's hopeless. It'll never make the diagnosis. Or if you aren't truthful, if the person fudges it, and often that's the case with children, and adolescents, they don't want to reveal their symptoms because they know they'll be taken out of the game or practice that they love to play. So it's a big problem with adolescents because they lie like crazy in order to stay in the game. So we are very keen to have a surefire diagnostic technique we're hoping it's going to be as simple as a blood test, and that is possible. Uh, I mentioned the concussion symposium that we had, um, that we have annually, and another keynote speaker in last year's symposium was a scientist from Sweden who said, ah, I know how to, uh, to detect concussion. You just do a blood test, and you do it my way, and you measure this and that, and that gives you the diagnosis. And there's, there's some, some validity to, to what he was saying, but it's not for sure yet. But I think, I think it won't be long. I think you know, we can now diagnose a heart attack with a blood test and possibly uh, next year we'll be able to diagnose a concussion with a blood test, or maybe not for 100 years. It's, 
My daughter has suffered multiple concussions over the last few years, and now even the slightest bump to her head triggers her symptoms all over again. Will she ever be less susceptible to getting concussions? Well, that, that, that is unfortunate and I'm sure very distressing for that family. It is true that as the number of concussions goes up, the amount of force necessary to cause a concussion goes down. So for example, most researchers will say it takes about 50 Gs of force to produce a concussion, the first concussion. But by the 10th concussion, it may only take five Gs of force. And the other distressing thing about repetitive concussions is that as the number goes up, the duration of symptoms also goes up. So that's a problem. And do you know what? We don't have a clue why that is. We don't know what happens in the brain to produce that increased susceptibility and increased duration of symptoms uh, as multiple concussions occur. But we still have plenty of people plenty of people who have had multiple concussions who ultimately become symptom free. And in general, young people, I regard myself as still young, Absolutely. but in general, young people do recover better than older people. They're more susceptible, like the, in fact, we now think that the, that the most susceptible uh, age for, for concussion is uh, during adolescent life, probably age 14, 15, 16, is worse than for infants, for example. We used to think the infant brain was the most sensitive to concussion, but current research points to the adolescent brain as being the time of greatest sensitivity. Okay, so final question. Um, there, there are one or two more that we'll save for next week, but final question. It's a nutrition question. Um, some doctors suggest avoiding sugar, refined foods, etc. Is there any credence to that? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think we really understand the nutritional aspects of recovery from concussion. It's what doctors are recommending or other therapists is now all over the map. Uh, we have omega fatty acids, uh, magnesium, uh, vitamin E, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, you know, many herbs. If you go to uh, a herbal remedy store, or if you go to a nutritionist, you're going to get a whole variety of non-evidence-based recommendations. I think probably a carbohydrate load isn't a good idea, but I think the evidence for any nutritional effect on concussion recovery is uh, poorly evidence-based.